All right, good afternoon, everybody. Um, we just had another update in our emergency operations center where yet again, we can look at the map and we can see the red dots growing as the COVID-19 virus continues to expand um, around the country and in our region. In particular, um, you're gonna see, you would see that the COVID-19 virus is expanding and people are getting infected coming up from uh, the New Rochelle Westchester hotspot into Fairfield County, where most of the folks who have been infected are located uh, to date. That said, in an abundance of caution, most of the schools in Fairfield County have announced they will be closed um, for two weeks or for the foreseeable future. Uh, we got Miguel Cardona, our commissioner here, who will be able to answer uh, more questions uh, along those lines. Um, one of the things he has done just to make sure that all of our superintendents of schools across the, the state have confidence, we're going to waive the 180 day requirement so that you have uh, the flexibility you need to make the public health decision in the best interests of your communities. I think we, we understand what closing a school means to communities, what it means to businesses, what it means to families. And we're working very hard to make sure that, um, you know, this works for you. You know, starting with our, uh, you know, our small businesses and our businesses in general. You know, first of all, um, you know, we at the state government are doing everything we can to give our commissioners and managers flexibility in terms of where their people work. And I, I want to say the same thing to our businesses. You know, you have the flexibility to make sure you know who has to be in the office, who doesn't have to be in the office, and to make those determinations. And for those folks who have, have to be in the office, um, Beth Bai is making a big effort right now in terms of expanding our daycare opportunities, just to make it easier for those, um, you know, uh, infants and toddlers as well as young people, give them alternatives where they can be while school is closed. We're trying to seek some waivers with our businesses, uh, for our businesses, so they may be able to open some uh, daycare and childcare at their facilities as well, just to make it a little bit easier for them going forward. I've heard a lot of folks worried that, look, if they, um, they show symptoms and they feel uh, that they should stay home and uh, maybe they're living paycheck to paycheck, they're hourly workers, what type of protections will there be for them? And uh, there we're working closely with our congressional delegation. You probably heard the president speak uh, last night on this subject. Rosa DeLora in particular is taking the lead on A, expanding our definition for unemployment compensation. So it includes sickness to make it easier for you to get uh, compensation, even though you're doing the right thing at that time, if you have to take some time off uh, to self-quarantine. I've heard from a lot of the small businesses who are uh, worried and saying, look, I'm a service business, service is down. If I lose two people, what does that mean to me? And uh, David Lehman, our head of economic and community development, working closely with the Small Business Administration. We're gonna be over the course of the next week being able to find how we can roll out our share of that $50 billion in very small, uh, low interest loans. You heard the president uh, mention just yesterday. We're working um, at DECD in terms of the loans that we have put out there to make sure we can um, you know, put off having to pay principal and interest. We're working with our banks as well, ways that we can maintain liquidity so that our small businesses know that they can keep um, going forward. Uh, we don't know whether this is gonna be one month or two months, what the duration is, but we are planning for the future. I've got a couple of other executive orders uh, that we've done. I mentioned the 180 day on the school year just to give our superintendents more flexibility. We do not want any more gatherings with more than 250 people, and that's gonna be an executive order. Uh, this is highly infectious, COVID-19. And those groups, um, especially when they're standing close by, Susan, step away a little bit. We should be a, a few feet um, separated from each other in all of these uh, public environments. I think 250 will be our limit. I'm recommending stay out of any uh, groups of 100 or more. I just think that's a safe way to go and make sure that you're able to limit um, you know, your exposure and others' exposure. And, and finally, um, uh, Josh Jabal and I are trying to think of all the ways that maybe people feel like they have to go and interface with the government. You know, the most obvious one is DMV, Department of Motor Vehicles. We hear that all the time. And while those lines are short and we're trying to get more people to be able to do this online, not in line, 
Uh, we're going to extend the duration at least 90 days for all renewals and the such. So you don't need to go to DMV for the near term. And we're going to be rolling out additional um, uh, services like that provided by the state so you don't feel the need to go in and congregate in areas where there may be a big group. Um, before I hand it over to Dr. Carter, I'd just like to say on a personal note, um, I've really been impressed with the people of the state of Connecticut, people stepping up, in particular uh, the nurses, folks of the hospitals under a great deal of stress, uh, more people, state employees and others raising their hand, volunteering, what more can I do? And uh, we're going to be asking more of each and every one of you. We mentioned when it comes to daycare, when it comes to small business, when it comes to our hospitals and nurses and nursing homes. Um, I want to thank you for bearing, going through this uh, you know, complicated time across the country. And I could not be prouder of the people standing with me here today and the professionals we have active. Dr. Carter. Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Matthew Carter. I'm the state epidemiologist with the Connecticut Department of Public Health. Um, Yesterday, as you know, I talked for some time about um, giving you a perspective about what's happening. Uh, this is a pandemic, it was declared yesterday. None of us have been through anything like this in more than 100 years. And I know that uh, I was asked several questions that asked me to look ahead at what, where things were headed. I got several emails last night from people who said, did you really say that? And I'd like to clarify. Um, one of the things I want to clarify is that testing is very important. No one should think that testing is not. And every day that I, I go home, usually much later than this, I turn on the TV and there are multiple programs on television with people on one side saying we should have had a test a long time ago, and on the other side, tests arrive now. What I was trying to say yesterday, and I'm sorry if I didn't set it clear enough, is these discussions will go on for a long time. People will write books about this. But right now, this week, we have to make decisions about what to do with the information that we have now, not the data that we're going to have next week or the week after this. We have to make decisions with what we have now. And up until this week, the only approved laboratory in Connecticut for coronavirus testing was the Connecticut Department of Public Health Laboratory a fine institution, a great lab, but a reference lab. Uh, five people are doing this test and are doing all the testing for all of our acute care hospitals. This was, a, this was a decision, a priority decision, a triage decision, because we need to test the people who are being admitted to our hospitals with pneumonia and or respiratory distress syndrome to, make a dis to find out if they had COVID-19 or not, because that's incredibly important information for our hospitals to have, so that we can protect our healthcare work, you know, nurses, doctors, uh, respiratory therapists, and all the other people that make a hospital run. Um, this week, both Quest and LabCorp, two large, perhaps the largest uh, uh, commercial laboratories in the country, started accepting specimens for outpatient testing with a physician's order. We have been working also with clinical laboratories at all of our acute care hospitals to develop the capacity for them to test at the hospital laboratory. Uh, we know that there's at least four or five that are far along in this process. Some have encountered difficulties uh, uh, ordering reagents that are necessary because every hospital in the country is trying to do this. Uh, and, and start this capacity. We expect that Yale New Haven Hospital will be the, be the first online, uh, hopefully in a few days. This will start to ease the burden for acute care hospitals. The most pressing problem that we have now, as I mentioned yesterday, is not the availability of a laboratory test, but the ability to get the throat swab and the nasal swab taken on the patient. Uh, and let me give you an example. Four weeks ago, if you had a fever and a cough and symptoms of influenza, you would go to your doctor's office. Somebody would use the swab. They would make the diet, do a quick test, and tell you you have influenza. Now, if you have fever and cough and those symptoms and you call your doctor's office, you're being told, we can't test you at our office because 
And it, fever, cough, those other symptoms are also the symptoms of COVID-19. And so primary care offices are not able to obtain the, the samples that they need. Uh, and, but at the same time, our emergency departments can't be places for these outpatients to test. That's why the focus has been on coming up with these alternate sites. We've asked our acute care hospitals to develop uh, an, uh, a way for people to go to the hospital with a doctor's order where they can be tested on the, on the grounds of the hospital but not in the emergency department. As you know, only one of those hospitals is in operation right now. Greenwich Hospital system is working. Uh, we anticipate another hospital to be online today. Um, they will be announcing that, uh, I won't be announcing the name of that hospital. Uh, and we hope to have additional ones in the next few days because we need a place for people to be able to get these samples uh, obtained in a safe environment. These samples will be going to our commercial laboratories. Uh, again, with commercial laboratories, they'll accept it with a doctor's order. I'd like to also talk a little bit about test results because as you know, our lab is running three shifts uh, a day now to do laboratory testing and can do between 40 and 60 people a day. Yesterday we had um, additional positive cases of coronavirus in Connecticut, COVID-19. We had one case of COVID-19 involving a resident of Stanford who is a woman in her 60s who recently returned from a trip to Italy. It's at Stanford Hospital. We have another case of a young woman in her 20s who was seen as an outpatient at Greenwich Hospital. She is a New York resident and is recovering at home in New York. Um, the way, just so you know, the way cases are counted in the United States, it's based on their, uh, their home of residence. So she will be counted as a New York State case even though she was diagnosed in Connecticut. We also have a child who is a confirmed positive case the child is a resident of Stratford who is exposed to a known case. This child is also home recovering. So far, our state public health lab has tested 95 patients. Uh, uh, 65, um, we've had six, six cases that have tested positive. That's, there are four from Fairfield County, one from Litchfield County, and one from New York State. Uh, that many of our specimens come from our uh, the rest of the state, none of the specimens in other parts of the state have tested positive for COVID-19 so far. Uh, this is, these are the data that we have. Uh, it's not a surprise that this is really clustered in Fairfield County. Uh, many of you know that uh, the situation in Westchester County, New York, and New Rochelle, they have uh, sustained community transmission, uh, and we are seeing this move into Fairfield County. Uh, there, th I'm sure there are people in Fairfield County, uh, uh, including someone who emailed me last night, uh, who expressed concerns because she said, well, you said I'd, uh, I should, if I'm sick, I should just stay home. And she said, is there even a point to staying home or is it too late? It is not too late to stay home. Uh, this is only going to work if all of us together do what needs to be done to slow the transmission of the virus. Um, I think that was the message that I was hearing last night when there were various, uh, from Dr. Fauci uh, and other national experts who were talking about this. You know, these community mitigations will only work if we do them together. Thank you. Um, but what's clear, and as I talked about yesterday, this is not norovirus. Norovirus is incredibly hard to kill. It stays on surfaces for months and weeks, and regular disinfectants won't, don't work against it. That's not the case here. Cleaning and disinfection with standard disinfections will destroy this virus, which is why those are the key components of the public health strategy. Could the commissioner uh, speak to that and give us an idea of how many schools and how many school systems have actually taken this step so far in Connecticut? First of all, I want to say I'm um, so impressed uh, with the work of our superintendents, of our teachers to step up and do what's right for kids. As the governor mentioned, uh, decisions about safety have to be made and 
having this waiver for 180 days allows districts to make decisions based on student safety, which is the most important thing. But closing a school is a last resort. For many students, as was mentioned earlier, they get two meals in our schools. So we want to make sure that that decision is made based on input from the local health department and, if needed, the state health department. State Department of Education does not close schools. So th that's a very important uh, thing to point out. There are currently 19 districts that have either closed or are scheduled to close in the next day or two. Dr. Carter, can I ask you uh, an epidemiological question? How, how do you anticipate this expanding in numbers of uh, patients over, the, say, the next two weeks? Uh, there's got to be some kind of uh, math uh, equation that you're anticipating, right? Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> and I actually like to start with uh, the comments that Dr. Fauci from the NIH made last night, and uh, which is when this is all over, probably uh, about 70 percent of our population will have had this infection. And this is between uh, the <clears throat> this wave and if there's a fall wave, um, a second wave that we see in the fall, because <clears throat> this is a virus that none of us have immunity to. Uh, right now, we're trying to slow that down. Um, what I expect to see in the next several weeks is uh, the continued spread into Litchfield and County and Fairfield County, uh, uh, Litchfield County and into New Haven County. Um, it might well, we might well see a focus as well uh, from either moving into the state from Massachusetts or Rhode Island. Um, this is something that is going to change day by day. Uh, we do not, this is... Um, these are events beyond our control, just like going back to the office yesterday at 5 and there's three more positive cases. Uh, and every day there's going to be new positive test results. And as the commercial laboratories get up and running, uh, it's important, I want to mention, COVID-19 is a reportable disease in Connecticut. It's also a reportable laboratory disease in Connecticut. And we have electronic laboratory reporting with these labs. And we will get these reports electronically when they're available, and they will be included in our reports to you uh, in terms of the number of tests that have been done. Is, is that prediction based on, I mean, there's, I, my understanding is there's modeling on the spread of, of the flu because there's a lot of uh, experience yes. with that. There are a lot of modelers trying to work on this one as well, using data from Italy and China and South Korea. Or is that still something you need to be further developed before you can rely on that sort of thing? Well, right now, we're looking at what happens in Washington State and California. Um, there's no reason for us. There's several weeks ahead of us um, in terms of where this epidemic is for them. There's, what we're trying to do is to slow this down here so that we're not, uh, we can slow, how to say this clearly, um, we will be where they are at s relatively soon. We'd like to slow that down if we can. And can you put that in concrete terms for people in Connecticut? What, it, looking at the Washington experience, and I understand there are other factors here. You guys are trying to slow it down in a way that Washington perhaps failed. But can you put that in concrete terms about what that spread, right, spread rate would mean in a state like this? If you can. Yeah. No, I... Um, that would, it's going to involve a little bit of speculation on my part. But I think uh, in the next month, we may see 10 to 20 percent of our population get this infection. 